I'll just record. I'll just record this because there's lots of people who want to see uh, see a recording of it afterwards. So today we're just talking about com common pediatric problems, and as I said, they're complicated cases. But but uh, um, I'll try to explain uh, um, what we can all learn about uh, how to how to manage such cases. But first of all, today I actually wanted to pay tribute to a friend and colleague who we lost uh, last week and. Uh, it's very sad, um, but uh, Dr. Guapo Kiagi um, passed on, and many of you are too young perhaps to know Dr. Kiagi, but uh, he was a pediatrician who worked in many hospitals. He worked in Rabaul for some time. He worked in uh, Mount Hagen. He worked in Kundiawa and uh, and and other places. And and uh, Dr. Kiagi was a senior, very senior and very well respected. Uh, um, a member of the pediatric society, one of the one of the most uh, one of the most senior pediatricians we had, and it's uh, it's been a source of uh, great sadness that he's passed on uh, um, th this week. So we uh, we uh, pay our respects to Dr. Kiagi and uh, and his family, and and uh, and pass our sympathies to them. Okay, I wanted to talk today about. Uh, um, uh, two cases, as I said. Um, the first is a is an eight year old boy with a common a common presentation. He came in with firstly abdominal pain, vomiting, and headache, and he'd had that for two weeks. Um, at, on different days, the headache was more prominent, and some days, uh, almost every day, he vomited, um, and uh, and uh, he also had uh, the abdominal pain. And he'd attended hospital twice um, in the previous two weeks, and. And uh, the doctors there thought perhaps he's got appendicitis and they wanted to rule out appendicitis. Um, and they concluded that he probably had gastroenteritis. So that was the uh, initial presentation. And I think we can learn some things from this presentation because the first one is that um, in children who've got vomiting without diarrhea, it's very unlikely to be gastroenteritis. So the doctors got it wrong because they thought they just thought about the most common problem rather than thinking about uh, problems that are a little bit more complex. I'll just, yeah. Um, and so whenever we are seeing a, a, a patient, I think it's really useful to go through, I'll just go, I'll just admit someone else. It's really useful to go through the stages of management of every sick child. So if you do these stages carefully, then you won't miss anything. And so um, every patient undergoes a, a system of triage. And then if they have emergency signs, they receive emergency treatment. And then a history and examination should be taken in detail. Then laboratory investigations if required. And then the main you, you come come up with a main diagnosis or a differential diagnosis, and then decide the treatment and supportive care and monitoring and discharge planning and follow up. And if we, almost every patient who is unwell needs to have all of these stages. And some, some we do more in one stage than others, that's okay. But almost all our um, very unwell patients need to go through all of these stages. And this is well outlined in the World Health Organization pocketbook of hospital care for children. So but think about these stages when we're seeing patients. And if you think about it, then you don't miss out in, on any of the stages. This is, this is all about the quality, improving quality of management of sick children. Right. So at triage, I'll, I'll try to explain the, the steps involved. And then I'll try to explain what for, for this child, what, um, uh, what was found. So normally at triage, we take a very brief history of the presenting problem. We've already heard that he had two, this boy had two weeks of, of uh, abdominal pain, vomiting and headaches. Um, and that, that doesn't tell us exactly what the diagnosis is. That's just uh, the presenting problem. So we usually take the temperature and weigh the child, make the, the basic things to do at the start. Because if you weigh the child, that can, get, that can uh, tell you a lot about if a patient needs drugs or medications, then what the dose of those medications should be. We, then, then we should make an assessment for um, the airway, breathing and circulation. That's as simple as that. So, and I think that if you get practiced at this the triage assessment, it'll really only take you a minute or two for any individual child. So you listen 
for obstructed breathing or strider. You, in terms of B for breathing, you look for cyanosis and check for signs of respiratory distress. So look that the chest is rising and falling well, that there's how, how much, uh, if any, chest in drawing there is or whether there's tracheal tug, and then check the oxygen saturations. That's B for breathing. Again, it only takes you 15 or 30 seconds to do, to do that. And then I think for, for C, for circulation, I always feel the hands and the feet of a patient. And I think you can feel, you can understand a lot by feeling the patient's hands and feet. And they should be, unless the environmental temperature is very cold, they should be warm. You should be able to feel the, uh, the, the radial pulse. And I would encourage you to, um, uh, as you do your ward rounds, just do this. I would go through this process and, and feel a patient's hands I'll, I'll just admit some more people, feel a patient's hands and feet and try to feel their radial pulse. And you'll get a good understanding of what a normal radial pulse feels like. And if you also measure the blood pressure, then you get a good understanding of what a normal pulse pressure feels like. So when we measure the blood pressure, we're measuring the systolic pressure and the diastolic pressure. And the part in between is the pulse pressure. And the pulse pressure is what gives us blood perfusion to the rest of the body. And if you get used to feeling pulses like the, the radial pulse, you'll be able to feel the pulse and think, think to yourself, ah, this child's pulse pressure is normal, right? Their pulse pressure is normal or this child's pulse pressure is too low or their, this child's pulse pressure is, is high. And there's, uh, there's different types of illnesses and pathologies that lead you to have a high pulse pressure or a low pulse pressure. But I want you to get used to feeling the hands and the feet looking at the capillary refill time and feeling the pulse pressure. That's, that's the way I think is best to assess the circulation. Obviously other things like the heart rate and the blood pressure are important too. And whether or not the child's conscious and alert, if they've got an impaired circulation, they're usually lethargic. But when you're, when you're assessing the circulation, you put all of those things together to make an assessment of the child's circulation. And as I say, that, that can be done in a very short period of time. Within one or two minutes, you can do all of that. And then the final part of the triage assessment is assess for lethargy and the level of interaction. And so I always try to talk to a child if they're old enough and try to interact with them. And you can see we stimulate them to be awake. And you can see uh, that tells you a lot about their um, D for disability or their neurology and whether, whether or not they're sufficiently awake or whether they're too lethargic or whether they're in coma, et cetera. If you can't get them awake by just talking to them and stimulating them, then you, you need to um, uh, do some other tests to see if they're awake. But the main reason to go through this, the triage assessment, is that I think if you practice it enough, then it should be possible to do it within uh, two minutes for any child. And so even the sickest child, you can do this in a, in, in a two minute period and get a very good understanding of whether or not the child has any emergency signs or any, any other signs that require immediate treatment. So this boy actually didn't have any airway or breathing signs and no major circulation signs, but he was quite lethargic. And this was, this is his, I'll just admit and it again. He was quite lethargic. And you can see this is a picture of him at the time that he presented. He was lethargic. He was sleeping, but he was rousable. And he, he was generally weak. He was gen generally seemed weak. He was able to comprehend questions. When you woke him up, he was able to comprehend questions, but he was unable to talk. He couldn't give you any, any resp verbal responses. And he looked like he had a weakness of the right side, his right arm compared to his left. He had the normal power in his other limbs when he was woken up, but he was lethargic and had uh, struggled to be woken up. He seemed in pain, um, especially uh, around his face and forehead, but he had no neck stiffness. So he'd been complaining of headache for several weeks and the light seemed to bother his eyes. And on further examination, so that's the triage examination of lethargy. That was a simple examination you can do within uh, 30 seconds. And then on further examination, his abdomen did seem distended and it was moderately tender. He seemed quite uh, tender all over and he had minimal bowel sounds. So when he first presents, you think that he's got abdominal pain, vomiting and headache. And there's a wide range of things that he could have. And then you do the triage assessment, airway, breathing, circulation, and then 
D for disability or neurology, and you assess the child's uh, um, level of uh, consciousness, and and then you can get a bit closer to the diagnosis. So I want you to, having seen the child and having uh, seen what the triage assessment is, what things do, are you thinking about could be wrong with him? What, whenever we come to, we see a child, we should have a short list of differential diagnoses in our mind. And then the rest of the history and examination is really about trying to rule in or rule out those diagnoses, all right? And as you get more information, then you either say, well, this diagnosis is more likely or this diagnosis is less likely. And then you can finally come to a diagnosis. That's the, the diagnostic process. And I want you to say from your understanding of this boy at the moment, what, what could be going on? You don't, have to, you, don't, you don't have to come to the exact diagnosis to manage this boy properly, but you do have to um, have at least a list of possible diagnoses in your mind. Well, what, what could be going wrong? Yes, Dr. Khaled. I think it's a little hard. The, the sound is not very good, but um, all right, well, we'll keep going. Eh? We'll keep going. Now, uh, people thought that maybe he's got a um, an abdominal problem. Maybe he's got a bowel obstruction. So he's got abdominal distension, he's got tenderness, and he's had vomiting. And so if you remember um, a couple of weeks ago, we looked at another case where there was a need to exclude a bowel obstruction. And I, I showed some x-rays of children that had small bowel obstruction, if you remember. And so this boy underwent some x-rays and I wanted to show you these x-rays. And if you remember last time, we talked about the, when you every, whenever you do an x-ray that um, is looking for a bowel obstruction, you should do two x-rays. You should do a, a supine x-ray, a normal x-ray, and you also should do a lateral decubitus x-ray. And if you remember last time when we talked about this, the, I said that the, the, lateral, the lateral decubitus x-ray will have, um, you should see if there's a bowel obstruction, a mechanical bowel obstruction, you should see multiple air fluid levels. And uh, if you remember, um, I showed you some x-rays where there was multiple air fluid levels. I, want you, I wanted to show you these x-rays because what they, what they show is that in this case, there was not multiple air fluid levels. And all you see is distended small and large bowel. And, uh, and on the lateral film, it still looks like distended small and large bowel. If you go back over the... the um, talk I gave a couple of weeks ago, you'll see the difference between air fluid levels and just gaseous distension of bowel. So you can virtually rule out a bowel obstruction based on a simple plain supine and lateral decubitus film because there's no air fluid levels. All right. And so the first thing that people thought about with this child was that maybe he's got a, a bowel obstruction. He'd had vomiting, uh, abdom abdominal tenderness, um, headache and fever uh, for, for two weeks. Now, the second thing people thought about was that maybe he's got meningitis. And uh, some, some of you might have thought of that, that maybe he's got meningitis because he's lethargic but rousable. He seems to have a, a weakness of his right arm and uh, the light bothers his eyes. So he had some signs of meningitis. Now, he didn't have other signs. He didn't have any neck stiffness. But, and, and he seemed to be most, um, most tender and painful in his face. So uh, if you can see, his, uh, over this area of his face, he seemed very tender and painful. This was his full blood examination. I'm not sure whether- Recording in progress. Okay. Um, can anyone see 
any uh, abnormalities on any of these uh, investigations. These were the investigations that he had. If you just look at the full blood examination first, I want you to be, I've talked about this before, but I want you to be able to make the most use of the full blood examination because we do full blood counts very commonly. And it's one, it's one investigation I think we don't often make the most use of. We don't look at all the different variables, all the different parameters and, and try, to, try to understand what they mean. In terms of ruling in or ruling out your invest, your um, the, 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 the conditions on your differential diagnosis. So for example, this boy's hemoglobin is, is okay, isn't it? But for a, uh, an eight-year-old boy, it's a little bit low. It's not, he's not anemic, but it's a bit low. Um, I'll get back to these things, the MCV in a minute, but his white cell count is 15.8. So that's a bit high, not very high, but it's a bit high. And of that, most of his white cells were neutrophils. So he's got a neutrophilia, uh, 13.4, that's that's a bit high. And his lymphocyte count is, is a bit low. So he's got, uh, what you'd say from this is he's, he's got a, a mild lymph, uh, a leukocytosis with predominant neutrophilia and a degree of lymphopenia. He's also got a platelet count that, what's the normal platelet count? 150 to 400,000. So his platelet count is high. And I think when we see those uh, features, often we just think, oh, there's a, there's a high neutrophil count, so maybe there's, a, there's an infection. But what we should think is the, the white cell count's high, the neutrophil count's high, even the platelet count's high, and that goes along, that usually goes along with a, a significant bacterial infection. And I, want, I guess I want you to be able to make the most of the full blood count. When you look at his is mean cell volume, that's 71. That's a bit low, isn't it? Normal, the normal MCV is around about 75 to, to 90, uh, so 78 or 79 in some laboratories. And his red cell distribution width is high. So normally that's up to about 15, uh, 14 or 15. And in this case, it's high. So that suggests that he might have iron deficiency as well. And so you can put all these things together to sort of tell a story really. So he's got a degree of iron deficiency. He's got a neutrophilia and a thrombocytosis. Right? And that's all just from the full blood count. And so I, I think because we don't have abundant investigations, we need to make the most of the investigations that we've got. And I think we can all try to interpret the full blood count in a bit more detail. This boy's serum sodium was 152. What might that tell you? It's high, isn't it? The serum sodium. Hypernatremia. Yeah, hypernatremia, exactly. And then you've got to think, well, how does it fit with the story? Is, is there some way you can fit it all with this boy's story? So he'd had two weeks of vomiting, headache, abdominal pain, and fever. Is there any way you can fit it in some way with the story? The hypernatremic dehydration. Yes, that's right. Yeah, so he was a bit dehydrated, as you'd expect, from his uh, vomiting for two weeks. And, uh, and that's probably the cause of his hyponatremia. And so it doesn't tell you what the diagnosis is, but it's just part of the story. OK, and when if you see this, you should think to yourself, well, what other features of dehydration are there? And so his urea was 14 and his creatinine's 80. So both of those are up a bit, aren't they? That's they're not normal. They're in the uh, above the normal range. And so that would also suggest that it would it would be supportive of the of the diagnosis that he's a bit dehydrated and he's got hyponatremic dehydration. Then, because there was concern about him having uh, meningitis, he went on to have a lumbar puncture. And this was what it showed. What do you think it shows? Um, 
but the, the white cell count's obviously high, isn't it? The white cell count is high, and and most of those white cells are, are polymorphs. So and his protein count is also high, not very high like sometimes you see with TB meningitis, but but it's high, and the glucose wasn't able to be measured um, uh, at the time. But we know, so we know that he's got. So, what do you think the diagnosis is probably? Bacterial meningitis? Yes, most likely bacterial meningitis. And I, I, what I want to encourage you to do is to be able to um, summarize a case in a very short, um, a short paragraph, if you like. And that, that enables us to communicate a case well. And so whether it's to your, um, your, consult your, uh, your consultants or your, to your registrars or your residents or to the nursing staff, um, or um, th then it's very useful to be able to, to summarize a case well. So just to summarize, this is an eight-year-old boy who had two weeks of fever, abdominal pain, vomiting, and headache. He presented with a tender abdomen and uh, weakness on his right side. Um, he uh, had a, a leukocytosis with uh, uh, neutrophilia and a thrombocytosis with hyper evidence of hypernatremic dehydration and, um, and had uh, a high white cell count on, this, on his CSF with, a, with predominant neutrophils. And therefore the diagnosis is back, likely bacterial meningitis with hyponatremic dehydration, right? And so I think it's just useful if we can, um, when we are communicating about patients to be able to describe them in that sort of summary, because then it conveys all the information you've got. It's not an exhaustive history, but you just summarize it in a paragraph. So when you, for example, when you're presenting, if you're for, for your practice for exams, if you're presenting a long case, then at the end of it, you can summarize the case just like I have done so, okay? Now this boy, because of his, um, uh, because of his the weakness of his right side, he went on to have a CT scan. And I know not everyone can do CT scans, but I want you to be able to at least interpret CT scans. And I wanted to show you his CT scan because I think it's very interesting what, what he had. All right, and so we think he's got bacterial meningitis, and I want to show you what his CT scan showed. Can can anyone see? Um, this is the CT scan of his head. Can anyone see what um, anything on the scan? I don't expect many of you to be able to interpret CT scans, but I think the more we see them, the better we will get at interpreting them. And sometimes they help tell a story. All right, and so uh, well, what can you see? When you're looking at a CT scan, again, I don't expect you to be able to interpret CT scans, but I want to explain how this helps to to um, uh, complete the story of this child. So when you're looking at a CT scan, you're looking at the the white is the is the is the uh, skull, of course, and the grey part is the brain. And you should be looking for symmetry or asymmetry when you look at a CT scan. So the brain, of course, is a symmetrical organ. This is the cerebellum uh, here. These are the the parietal lobes. These are the frontal lobes. Uh, occipital lobes here. Actually, it's a bit higher up. So this is this is the ox occipital lobe going into the cerebellum. I, I this is the uh, the third ventricle, the fourth ventricle here, and I hope you can see that there looks like there's asymmetry. There looks like the 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 brain on this side is the same as the rest of the brain on the. This is the right side of his brain, and this is the left side of his brain. If there's if there's increased density, that is inc more whiteness or more um, brightness, then often that represents 
um, uh, bleeding. But if there's reduced density, so more blackness, that represents increased water. And I, I think you can probably see that there's more blackness of, of this boy's brain here in the left frontal region. So if you remember that his, um, uh, his major neurological problem was the inability to move his right arm. And uh, if you think where, where is the motor, um, the motor cortex for the, the motor cortex for the right arm is uh, in the right, in deep within the right frontal lobe, it's frontoparietal. And uh, on the left side, remember the left side of the brain controls the right side of the body. So can anyone, does anyone know what, what this is? I'm sorry, uh, say that again. Is that abscess? Yeah, very, very good. It, it, it could be an abscess, that's right. It could be a developing abscess. Yeah, it wasn't an abscess at this point because when you, you can tell if it's an abscess, if you, this is a, CT scan with some contrast. And normally you'd see an abscess outlined, but this is the development of an abscess. You're, you're absolutely right. And it's a, an area of what we call cerebritis. So we often think of meningitis just being an inflammation of the coverings of the brain, but often it, especially when we see neurological abnormalities, it's where there's been a, um, an, the infection is also involving the brain. And in this case, that the infection is involving the brain. There is a developing cerebral abscess. There's actually a, 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 um, a subdural empyema. This is harder to see, but overlying the brain in this area here, there's an empyema, and that just means a collection of pus, and there is an abscess within, there is a developing abscess within the brain. This is an area where this boy's had uh, what is like a stroke. Right? You can have a stroke from an ischemic event or an abscess formation or an area of cerebritis. It, it, it um, doesn't have to be a large vessel, that, vessel that's blocked. It can be a microvascular stroke. So this boy had had, he's got meningitis with a subdural empyema and he's had a stroke with a developing cerebral abscess. And so when the the what I wanted to convey about this child is usually when we see children who've got um, meningitis, the, the bacteria normally come from typically from the throat and they get into the bloodstream and then they circle around the, the body and then they, they um, uh, get onto the meninges and cause meningeal inflammation and meningeal uh, uh, infection. And then sometimes they penetrate into the brain. This boy's meningitis was different. And I wanted to convey this because this type of meningitis I've seen quite a lot in, in PNG, and I wanted to explain why this is a bit different. And uh, the rest of his CT scan tells, again, tells the story. But also, remember I said he had a lot of pain and tenderness in the front, in, in his face, in the, uh, over his uh, uh, cheeks and in his forehead. What could that be? Sinusitis. Very good, yeah. So this boy had severe bacterial sinusitis. And, and when you see a frontal lobe lesion like this, when you see signs of frontal meningitis, he had frontal meningitis with a frontal developing cerebral abscess. If you see any child who's got a frontal cerebral abscess, then likely they've got that from their sinuses. And I'll just show you just some other cuts from his CT scan. So this was... This is the other cuts from his CT scan. And I think you can see that I'll just show you, I'll explain what they are. The, these are the orbits, all right? This is his eyes. And these are his maxilla, this is his nose, right? These are his ethmoid sinuses coming down here. And these are his maxillary sinuses. These are the paranasal sinuses. And the, of course, the paranasal sinuses should be filled with air, shouldn't they? So they should be air on the CT scan is black, right? And I'm, I'm going through this because I, I want you to have a bit of an understanding of how to diagnose sinusitis uh, if you see a child with meningitis. So this boy had um, his 
his right maxillary sinus was black. But you can see there's a, like, what's this? Can anyone see what that is? Osteomyelitis. Yeah, a bit like osteomyelitis. It's an air fluid level. It's an air, he's got an air fluid level in his maxillary sinus on the right side. But on the left side, what has he got? Pus. Yeah, good, pus, yeah. He's got pus in his maxillary sinuses. And if you, especially on the left side, now remember where, the, where his frontal abscess was or his frontal stroke was on the left side. So he's got direct spread from his maxillary sinuses into the, the, into the frontal lobe. And on the, on the um, in his um, eth frontal and ethmoid sinuses, they're the, the ethmoid sinus, so you have maxillary sinuses, frontal sinuses, ethmoid sinuses. And you can see that they're packed with, again, with, with uh, fluid. And, and in this case, the fluid is pus. All right. This is the normal brain at the base of the brain, and this is the cerebellum. But the important thing to note is often we often we just uh, don't look at the sinuses when we're looking at a CT scan. But you should see again symmetry, and they should be uh, fi filled with air. So they should the sinuses should be black. I just want you to be able to look at a CT scan in in the future and be able to say that whether a child's got. Uh, air-filled or fluid-filled sinuses. Okay, so just to the, recap, the, the sinuses in children don't develop until you're about somewhere between three and seven years of age. They're not fully developed until about seven. So this boy was eight. In fact, some of the sinuses don't really develop until ch children are teenagers. The, there's ethmoid sinuses, which are next to the nose. There's maxillary sinuses, which are over the cheek. There's frontal sinuses, which are uh, at the for forehead. And then there's a sphenoid sinus, which is further back behind, deep within the nose. And that one doesn't develop until teenage years. So I think it's just good, important for us to know about sinuses because sinus disease is, is, is quite common and it can lead to quite serious disease as, as in this boy. Right. So this boy had meningitis and sinusitis and a, and a cerebral empyema and a stroke or developing cerebral abscess. And the reason why I wanted to talk about this case is because mostly when we think about meningitis, it's, it's usually due to one particular bug. It might be due to streptococcus pneumonia or it might be due to haemophilus. But in this case, oh, excuse me for just one moment. I just need to, to let somebody in. Sorry, excuse me. Yeah, it, usually when when we have meningitis, when a child has meningitis, it's usually due to one bug. But in this case, when you've got sinusitis leading to frontal meningitis, it's often due to multiple bacteria, right? Because you think the bugs that collect in the sinuses are often the bugs from the bacteria from the throat, and instead of it just being one bug that gets in the bloodstream and gets the meninges, these are all the bugs that have been sitting in the sinuses and they can spread to the, to, the, uh, uh, to, to, to the meninges and to the frontal lobes. And so often this boy had three bugs. He had Streptococcus intermedius, which is the common bacteria that causes uh, sinus disease. He also had Staph aureus and he also had anaerobic bacteria. Um, in, in his um, in his sinuses and and uh, in his spinal fluid, and so the treatment was a bit different to children who normally just have uh, bloodborne meningitis. So normally, children with bloodborne meningitis, we would treat with <coughs> just keftriaxone, and that would be that would be per, that would be just enough. You don't need to do anything else for for typical meningitis. It's just keftriaxone. For the in this case that wouldn't have been sufficient. And this boy needed keftriaxone and flucloxacillin for the staph and metronidazole for the anaerobes. Now, I'm not trying to say most, uh, most children with meningitis, they don't need these three, three antibiotics. But if you've got sinus disease leading to meningitis, then that's what you need, all right? Whether it's, whether it's mastoiditis or whether it's 
particularly with it, if it's frontal sinusitis, like maxillary sinusitis, <coughs> then, then you need to cover for streptococcus, staph, and anaerobes as well. This boy also needed, um, remember I've, I talked a couple of weeks ago about the, um, the, the medical conditions that require both pediatric and surgical input. And this boy needed not only those antibiotics and medical treatment, but he also needed source control. And often we see children that have got a, a, an infection, whether it's osteomyelitis or septic arthritis, they need the input of the surgeons and that has to be fairly prompt. And so this boy needed a washout of his sinuses and a drainage of his cerebral empyema. Now, I just wanted to show you what his cerebral empyema looked like, just to give you an understanding of what, I, I hadn't seen this very often before, and I think it's very instructive to see what it actually looks like. This was his, this is what the <laughs> surgeons were able to show his empyema looked like. So this is, as you can see, this is uh, his um, cranial cavity, cr his skull open, and this is the pus that they found in the, um, just on the meninges, all right? And so often when we give antibiotics, we hope that that is going to be treated, but sometimes it requires that that can be washed out, all right? So he needed a wash out of his sinuses and a wash out of, it, of the empyema. That was only last week and, and this week, He's recovering very well. In fact, it was very early in the week he had the washout and by yesterday he was doing very well. His stroke was resolving with the antibiotics and, uh, and he, was, he was smiling and he was eating well. He'll need four to six weeks of antibiotics because he's probably got a, a sinus osteomyelitis as well, as somebody said, and he'll need some anticonvulsants because he had some seizures as well. So I think this is a really interesting case of... Um, we of a, of a child that had a common problem with, with that could easily be missed unless you take a detailed history, unless you go through all the stages of management and unless you get both uh, medical input, pe the pediatricians, but also the surgeons as well. So I thought this was a really good case um, with, a, with a good outcome. I wanted to know if anybody had any questions about this case before I go on. How old was he again? Uh, he was eight years old. He is, he is, he is eight years old. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. You wouldn't see this in an infant, right? This type of meningitis doesn't occur in, in an infant or a young child because they don't have sinuses, right? Sorry. They don't have, and that's why, that's, why, that's why you don't see sinusitis in such uh, children. But in, in older children, uh, and uh, all those school-age children and teenagers, you'll sometimes see sinusitis like this. Pearl, thank yes. you for the case. Uh, in the case, like uh, in a setting, the CD scan really helpful to, to see the abscess and do a, a surgical intervention. Uh, like in a case here in Solomon Island where we don't have CD scan yeah. and probably we'll just clinically cover with antibiotics. Uh, what else can we, can we do apart from the antibiotic uh, treatment? Yes, it, it, it's important, John. I, I wasn't trying to say that, you know, every child like this needs a CT scan. I think you can treat them adequately without that. I was trying to, I, what I wanted to do is demonstrate the pathology. And I, I think, John, you're right, that if, um, if you see a child who's got so, signs of meningitis with some signs of a stroke, like, like this boy had, it's a matter of putting it all together like a story, right? You've got a child who's got features of meningitis and, uh, um, and, and signs where there's neurological impairment like a stroke. So you've got to think, well, maybe there's a cerebral abscess. And, and then the other part of the story is that there looks like there's sinusitis. And you can take plain x-rays to see if there's um, uh, a sinus disease as well. It doesn't, you don't have to do a CT scan. And then I think that it, what, I was, what I was hoping to do is that you take away from this 
is that you, yes, you don't need to CT scan. You need to be able to put the story and the clinical picture all together and realize that this child has meningitis. You can do a lumbar puncture and show that he's got meningitis and you can make a distinction between a, a, a common sort of meningitis where you get bacteremia and, and uh, the, the um, meninges are inflamed where you can treat with just keftriaxone and, and, and the type of meningitis that comes from sinusitis. And in most of those cases, if you give keftriaxone, flucloxacillin and metronidazole, you'll be covering all the bugs that cause sinus disease and meningitis. And, and you'll be, uh, and, and most children like that will get better. So although it might be optimal to, you know, do a sinus washout or to, um, uh, to, to uh, drain the empyema, do a CT scan, I think you can actually treat these children pretty well if you put the put this full story together. It, does that make sense, John? Thank you. And probably the, the cause of antibiotic, like how long it takes, yes. like depends on the, the outcome, I think. Yes, that's right. And I think usually, of course, our treatment for meningitis is, you know, 10 days with keftriaxone, and that's fine. That's all you need to do. But I guess if I was wanting you to try to identify those few children. It's not many. Most of the children with meningitis don't need this type of treatment, but a few older children who have this type of complicated disease, suppurative sinus, uh, sinusitis causing cerebral abscess or meningitis. And you're right, it does depend on the recovery. If a child's recovered within a few days, their, their um, uh, neurological um, problem is resolved, then 10 days is probably enough. But if, if they've had a more complicated course and you think they've, they've had a stroke and you think that they've got sinus-based disease and you haven't been able to drain it because you, you, your surgeons aren't able to do that, then I think probably they need a more prolonged course of antibiotics, yeah. It, does that make sense? Thank, thank you, thank you, Paul, thank you. Okay, any other questions about this case? Uh, so this, um, Trevor, this, um... Prolonged antibiotic would include the ceftriaxone as well? Uh, yes, yes, Hilda, it does, yeah. I mean, so this boy will need, um, I mean, this is, again, an unusual case. Most child, most times we, uh, uh, 10 days of keptoaxone is perfectly fine for most cases of meningitis. But, we, but just where you've got cerebritis, a stroke, something unusual, then you just need a, a bit more, uh, a longer course. If you, It's like when we have, say a child with osteomyelitis, we will treat for you know three weeks at least, sometimes even longer with flucloxacillin. And uh, in this case, this boy is going to need three or four weeks of, of antibiotics. Again, an atypical case, I don't want you to think it's the normal way we treat meningitis, <coughs> but it's putting all, all the features together and realizing this is atypical and, and uh, to treat this child properly because of his deep-seated infection in the sinuses and in the brain, he'll need a longer course with ceftriaxone and flucloxacillin and metronidazole. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, I was going to talk about one more case, and I thought this was an interesting case because um, it's I, I I've talked before about um, chronic respiratory disease, and I won't I won't give this case in as much detail as the previous one. But this is a common a common presentation we see, isn't it? That a, a child will have recurrent admissions to hospital with acute lower respiratory infection. Right? They come in with uh, multiple episodes of acute pneumonia or viral bronchiolitis, and I think we need an approach to such children. And so this was a child, a two-year-old boy with recurrent hospital admissions. He'd had four admissions in the previous six months with pneumonia or viral bronchiolitis. And this was what he looked like. Can anyone see anything on the, on the picture? A chest deformity. Yes, he's got a chest deformity. That's right. And uh, what could that be due to? Congenital heart disease. Yes, he, he, it could be congenital heart disease, um, Hilda, but usually with, with congenital heart disease, the chest deformity is the opposite way. That it's usually 
that there's a pectus carinatum deformity, isn't it? Carinatum meaning a protrusion um, of his chest. Whereas in this case, the, the chest looks like it's sucking in, it's pectus excavatum, right? The, pec the, the chest is sucking in. And so there is a difference. Um, usually with congenital heart disease, the chest is a barrel shaped chest or the chest is more pectus carinatum, but in this case, it's pectus excavatum. Well, what can that mean? It's, it's not coming through so clearly, but I mean, this can either be one of two things. Either the child is born with a chest deformity like this, a, me a mechanical uh, abnormality of their chest wall. I mean, that's, a, that's rare, but it does occur. And the second possibility is that the child's got chronic airflow obstruction. So if you see children that have got a chest deformity like this, there's one of two, two reasons. Either they were born like that, or they've developed that over time because they've got chronic airflow obstruction. And so they're making additional effort all the time. If we see this acutely, we say they've got chest in drawing. But if you've got um, a, a chronic respiratory distress where, with chronic airflow obstruction, like chronic asthma or um, anything that causes chronic airflow obstruction, you'll, you'll have a chest deformity that, that um, instead of being dynamic it's there all the time it's constantly there and so this boy when you look at this this looks like he's got evidence of either he was born like this or he's got chronic airflow obstruction so whenever I see a child who looks like this I always ask the parents it was was that abnormality of his chest that his chest sucking in was that there from the time he was born or the first few weeks of life or is it something that's developed over time and with this child this was something that developed over the the in, in the second six months of life and up until he was two years of age. It got progress progressively worse. So again, taking a history is very important if you uh, see any abnormality. And I wanted to just describe, I won't go through all this child's case, but I wanted to describe the sorts of questions you should ask in, try in trying to make an assessment of chronic respiratory distress. And so, Often we see children, the most common thing is we see children that have had a viral infection and they have it for a few, a week or two, and then they get better for a week or two, they're back to normal and they, they get another virus and they're sick again for another week or two. And that's different. That's different to a child who's coughing or has respiratory distress every day. And so the first question you should ask in the assessment of a child with chronic respiratory symptoms or a child that keeps coming back to your hospital is whether or not the problem is truly chronic, that is, it's there all the time, or whether it's intermittent, that is, it's recurrent respiratory distress. And this seems like a, a simple, it's a very simple set of questions to ask, but we have to go into detail with the parents to, to understand that, to, to know whether they're, they're, the child is chronically has chronic respiratory distress or whether it's recurrent you should ask also whether they're and look yourself and make an assessment of whether or not the child's uh, cough sounds wet or dry it's quite important do they have a, a chronic wet cough or a chronic dry cough and and uh Sometimes parents won't know that distinction, but you, we need to get good at making an assessment ourselves when we hear a child coughing, whether it sounds like a really wet cough or it's a dry cough. We're, you want to know about whether there's fevers and you want to know whether there's nasal discharge. And that, that's quite important because children that have chronic uh, purulent nasal discharge will again often have sinus disease and often they'll have like a bacterial bronchitis, all right? They'll have... Uh, um, as well as recurrent viral infections, they'll have bacterial bronchitis. And they typically have chronic wet cough, runny nose, so often fevers, flare-ups of their condition where they have, have uh, episodes of uh, uh, chronic uh, or acute um, uh, bronchitis on the background of, of, of sometimes chronic bronchiectasis or sometimes, uh, uh, sometimes asthma. So again, it's putting all those 
features together to tell a story. On examination, you should look for signs of chronic chest wall deformity. And I think it's important when we're looking at a child's breathing, I want you to observe that expiratory phase. So observe the, the way the child breathes in and the way the child breathes out. And normally when we breathe in, we take a bit longer to breathe in than we do to breathe out, all right? Because it's we're using muscles to breathe in and we're just allowing the elastic recoil of our chest to breathe out. It's, it's a shorter phase. And, but I want you to look at children from now on and know and see whether their expiratory phase is longer than their inspiratory phase, because that's a feature of airflow obstruction, right? Whether it's bronchiolitis or whether it's asthma or whether it's chronic airflow obstruction from chronic uh, asthma or chronic bronchiectasis, they'll have a prolonged expiratory phase. And then, then you should listen for whether there's wheeze or crackles or bronchial breathing. I'll just, I'll, just, uh, um, I'll just play you the audio of this child's uh, chest. I, I can record the audio of some uh, children. Just listen to this. Let me see if I can play this. It's not very clear, but I hope you heard two things. I hope you heard that the 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 sound when he breathes in is shorter than the sound when he breathes out. And that suggests that there's chronic airflow obstruction. And I hope you could hear that there's a, a quality of that expiratory phase that sounded a bit like wheeze. Not very good, but at least I want you to be able to appreciate that there is a prolonged expiratory phase. And, and you can do two things. You can listen for it with your stethoscope, but you can also see it when you're watching the child breathe. You need to assess the child's, just as part of your examination, assess the child's growth and also assess for other signs of chronic illness um, uh, or, or immune deficiency. So looking for lymphadenopathy, hepatosplenomegaly, looking to see if the child's got a cold crush um, and, and look for other signs of, of, of chronic illness. When you make your assessment of a child who's got recurrent hospital admissions for respiratory disease, you want to make, you want to say, first of all, is it, as Dr. Panumo said, is it the heart or is it the lungs? If, it the, if it's the lungs, is it or is it intermittent or recurrent, right? Because the, the, the way you think about the differential diagnosis of each of those is very different. So I, if you follow this type of uh, history and examination, you'll, you'll be able to make that distinction pretty clearly. Now, this, this was the X-ray of this boy that I've just showed you. And I wanted to go through just how you make an assessment of uh, a chest X-ray, looking for whether a child has airflow obstruction. So remember, when you, um, when you hear a history, you're making, um, you take a history, you do an examination, you've got a differential diagnosis and then your examination, your, your, your investigations, whether it's an X-ray or a full blood count, they're, they're, they're designed to rule in or rule out certain diagnoses. So you need to have them in your mind. So after seeing this child, I think we could, after seeing this, uh, we could probably have in our mind that this child probably has, it's, it, is it his heart, is it his lungs? It's probably his lungs because the chest deformity is, not, is in, not out. That's the first thing. Is it acute or chronic? It's probably chronic, right? Uh, and you and because of the breath sounds, he's got prolonged expiratory phase. Probably it's chronic airflow obstruction. So on the X-ray, we'd be looking to see whether the child, oops, whether the child had um, a normal inflation of the chest or hyperinflation. And I've just written here what the um, criteria for normal inflation are adequate inspiration or hyperinflation. And adequate inspiration is you can either count posterior ribs. So I'll just my arrow, I hope you can see, but this is the first posterior rib. This is the clavicle. 
the first rib, the second rib, the third rib, the fourth rib, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, right? You can just see the 11th rib, but that's under the diaphragm. So that's okay. So this boy has 10 anterior, uh, posterior ribs being seen, all right? And no adequate inspiration is eight or nine posterior ribs. If you've got 10 posterior ribs visible, then that's hyperinflation. So you can see there's hyperinflation of the left lung, all right? The other features of hyperinflation are that the diaphragms often look flat. And you can see that in this case, the diaphragm is flatter on the left side than it is on the right side, all right? So I, I, I'll send this, uh, these slides around and you can have a look at them, but I wanted you to just be clear about what represents hyperinflation on a chest X-ray. You should look at this child's growth as well. And despite his chronic respiratory distress, he was, he was gaining weight fairly well. Um, that, doesn't, that doesn't mean he's got, not got chronic respiratory distress, that he's not got a chronic airways disease, but, but he was uh, managing to gain weight quite well. This was his full blood count. And uh, remember, we talked a bit about this before, but I want you to be uh, make the most of the full blood count. And so his hemoglobin was low. If you look at his on both the two signs he had to look at to start with were a pectus excavatum. And also look at his hands. His hands look very pale, don't they? So his hemoglobin was a bit low. His MCV was a bit low. Remember MCV normally 75 to 80, uh, 85. Um, his red cell distribution width was high. So looking at all this, you might say that perhaps he's got iron deficiency. That would be likely that he's got iron deficiency. You don't need to measure iron levels or anything like that. I can look at a blood film and see whether a child's likely to have iron deficiency. And that can be quite helpful because iron deficiency would go along with a child having chronic respiratory disease and make them more likely to have recurrent respiratory viral infections. It puts you at risk of having recurrent respiratory viral infections. The rest of his blood film looks fairly normal apart from his lymphocytes were low. And if you saw that, you might think, well, perhaps he's got an immune deficiency or perhaps he's got, that's just a feature of his, his viral infections. And this boy had a high eosinophil count. And you might think looking at that, well, perhaps he's got an allergy like asthma. Asthma gives you a high eosinophil count, or perhaps he's got a parasitic infection as well as his chronic respiratory disease. So you might treat him with albendazole because you might, you'd want to treat him for hookworm because he's got iron deficiency, you see. So just with just by making the most of the full blood count and making the most of a chest X-ray, I think we can put the history and the examination and simple investigations all together, and it tells you a story. So this boy, the differential diagnosis was recurrent viral infections, perhaps immune deficiency, probably airway obstruction, chronic wet cough or bro chronic bronchitis, and iron deficiency anemia. Of course, he could have had tuberculosis as well, but more likely it's the other conditions. This was, uh, this boy came in some time ago and this is him now and he's, um, he's doing very well. He got treated for asthma and chronic lung disease and, uh, and he was treated with Ventolin by meter dose inhaler and spacer. And you can see that he's using a, a homemade spacer with a, a Coke bottle and a homemade spacer. He got prednisolone to start with and he got put on a preventer agent, which I think for children that have got chronic airways disease, this is very important that they not just have salbutamol, but go on some a preventer. And some of the pharmacists, I know it's not widely available, but some of the pharmacies will have fluticasone or budesonide as a, a inhaled steroid preventer. And that can be quite useful in children who've got chronic asthma like this boy. Because, of he, because he had a wet cough, we treated him with antibiotics for four weeks. 
just low dose once a day erythromycin, uh, <laughs> a course of antibiotics followed by four days, four weeks of uh, erythromycin and iron supplements because of his iron deficiency anemia. So the point of showing this case in a way was to show you that if you go through a history and examination and simple investigations, you can make the distinction <clears throat> between acute recurrent viral infections and chronic respiratory disease and not all chronic respiratory disease is tuberculosis. Some of it is asthma or chronic bronchitis. And we can treat that quite well as well if we, have, uh, if we think about the different components. And sometimes children will need iron supplementation because if you are lacking in iron, then that puts you at risk of recurrent infections. All right. OK, so that's uh, just those two cases. And I just thought that. I'd summarize the lessons from this week, from these two cases. And the first one is that vomiting without diarrhea is not gastroenteritis. So never think a child who's got vomiting that doesn't have diarrhea has gastro. We should never make that diagnosis. But vomiting plus headache, should we should think of central nervous system pathology. And there are different sorts of meningitis that mostly it's bloodborne spread of bacteria to the brain, to the meninges. But the, the other sort, the other sort, which is less common and more, but more common in older children is direct spread from the sinuses, either the frontal maxillary sinuses or sometimes the mastoid processes like mastoiditis. And that's often polymicrobial. And it's often caused by different bugs that cause meningitis normally. Remember, remember the age that children develop sinuses. They don't have them when they're young infants or, or uh, up to two or three years of age. So children up to three years of age don't get sinusitis. But, but sinusitis can be viral or it can be allergic or it can be just purulent bacterial sinusitis like the boy I showed you today. And if a child's got a bacterial infection, then you need to give antibiotics, but you also need to try to have good source control. And that will be, that can be um, draining uh, a septic arthritis or debriding a, uh, an osteomyelitis or draining the sinuses, whatever it takes to get good source control. And then the second case showed that there's a differential diagnosis of chronic lung disease and it's often multifactorial. There's can be airways disease or chronic bronchitis, and, but, but there's nothing, there's, there's always something we can do. And there's often many factors that can, we can modify. And I, I want you, I guess, I, at some other stage, we might talk in a bit more detail about asthma treatment, but I think it can be very useful to have both um, acute asthma treatment and have children on preventer agents. And uh, they'll become increasingly available. So that's all I wanted to say today. That's those two cases. I think that's a lot. Um, we've covered a lot of ground today. Um, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions in the next few minutes if, if you have any. Thank you very much, Trevor.